Good morning, everybody. Just waiting for a few more attendees to join us, and then we'll get uh, get started. Okay, everybody. Okay, I see, still see folks joining here. So, uh, but I think I'm going to jump into things. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, hope you've had a, a great a great start to the day. Um, when I arrived at the office, the sun was shining, which is the first time that's happened, I think, in about a week. Uh, but uh, it's a little cloudier now. But I'm hoping that the sun will come back. Um, my name is Patrick Sullivan. I'm the President and CEO of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us today. As many of you may know, the Chamber has been developing and implementing our Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Action Plan and Policy over the last few years. In fact, Josh, uh, who uh, we'll speak in a little while, um, presented uh, an update to, uh, to our membership committee just this morning. We're very excited with the progress that's being made. But as a part of this plan, we're engaging with various groups doing work in a variety of topics, including supplier diversity. One of our past chairs, Cynthia Dorrington, is a strong advocate for this. Uh, and if I think back uh, five years, uh, Cynthia was, uh, a, uh, in fact, a champion uh, in this area for us, for the chamber, uh, and uh, was very helpful uh, in uh, in helping us to move forward with our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion plans that are now bearing fruit. And here we are, fast uh, forward five years, uh, uh, and we're signing, a, we've signed a memorandum of understanding with her sister, Cassandra Dorrington, our guest today, and the president and CEO of the Canadian Aboriginal and Minority Supplier Council, or CAMC. Uh, Cassandra can tell me if I pronounced that uh, correctly. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Whew. Okay. Uh, I'll pass it over to Cassandra in a few minutes to talk more about the important work that CAMC does. But we're really excited to be hosting this webinar with CAMC today. Supplier diversity is an integral step in becoming a more inclusive business. We know when we make our workplaces more diverse, we become more productive, creative, and more innovative. And this is also true for our suppliers as businesses move forward in their DE. Uh, a and I journey. We encourage you to think about it, not only for your internal staff, but for the people you work with outside of the office as well. The Chamber is dedicated to achieving supplier diversity in all of our events, and with the help of CAMC, we hope to further grow this diversity. So thank you very much for, to everyone who submitted questions for our presenter. Uh, and uh, when we get to the Q&A, please feel free to type any other questions in the, top, uh, the chat box. Welcome, Cassandra. And thank you very much for joining us today. And I'm excited to, uh, to hear the presentation. And I think we should let everybody know we're recording this. So this will be available later as, uh, as well. If you'd like to pass it on to, uh, to other folks that you may, may know or companies that would like to see this. So over to you, Cassandra. Okay, then perfect. Well, Patrick, thank, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And you're absolutely right, time passes quickly. We talked about this many years ago and it's amazing how over the last probably five to seven years, supplier diversity has become an item that many organizations are now saying, how do I fit in and what do I do for this? Beforehand, we started it, people were talking about, what is supplier diversity? Can you explain that again? And now we're, the question's moved on to how do I implement it? So good morning, all. What I'm interested in doing over the next few minutes with you, probably 30 minutes, is taking you through a journey on what is supplier diversity, why it's important, and how do you get involved? And so therefore, we'll have some time at the end to talk a little bit about any customized questions of what does it mean to you, sort of what are the key benefits, you know, does your, does the opportunities align with where you are. So let me just take you through and hopefully you can all see my deck as I go through. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about who is CAMPC, what it is, and what is supplier diversity in general, to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to go from there into let's talk about the benefits of 
Should you become a certified supplier with supplier diversity or should you, should you become a corporate member? Because there's different roles you can take. And how do you utilize that to the best experience so that it can help you grow your business? Now, if I step back a little bit and I'm going to say Campsie, in 2004, Campsie was created. At that time, no one even knew what supplier diversity was or it didn't have a big impact on anything. And indeed, our whole focus had been about when it was created in 2004, how do we identify, certify these diverse owned businesses? How do we connect them into the supply chain of corporate Canada? And in essence, how do we grow economic wealth for these underrepresented groups? And so at this time, supply chain had been working well in Canada, but not working well for all of us. And so we're trying to say there's some who are not at the table. There are some who are not having access to opportunities. How do we get them included in that? And so therefore, CAMSI was focused to focus on Indigenous-owned businesses, as well as minority-owned businesses in particular. That was our key focus and get them at the table to help build their competitive wealth. Now, for all of us, I know in this day and age now, when I say the word Indigenous, hopefully you all think of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis people. Okay, that's what we're talking about when we talk about Indigenous. When we're talking about minority-owned, we're talking about whether it's Black-owned, whether it's persons of African descent, whether it's Filipino, Japanese, Korean, whatever the Canadian government uses when they use the term visible minority in their employment equity, we're using that same term. So it's really people of color is what we're looking at. Okay, so let me be very clear on that. Now, uh, just, to, just to backtrack a little bit on that, we didn't just come up with the concept of supplier diversity. Supplier diversity had been an entity in the U.S. for now it's coming into 50 years. So U.S. companies were indeed looking at using minority-owned businesses to actually work with. And that had started around the times of the civil rights movement. So think about the late 60s, early 70s, there was fighting in the streets. And all of a sudden, the government in the U.S. said, you know, the only way we eliminate or reduce the fighting in the street if we actually bridge the chasm between the haves and the have-nots. And that means if we include these Black-owned businesses in, the, in that realm of actually creating wealth for them, creating employment for the people in their neighborhood, if we do that, we will reduce the fighting in the streets. So the federal government at that time, it was Nixon who signed off on having supplier diversity. So anyone doing contract work with the U.S. government must also be doing work with Black-owned businesses. It moved from black owned businesses start to include women, start to include Hispanic. They have a whole roster of what they include in the US when they talk about supplier diversity. So it had been working really well in the US. And then all of a sudden the automotive community said, why are we not doing that in Canada? And why are we only doing that in the US? Because of course there's an automotive corridor that runs up through the middle of the US into Canada. So the automotive community in addition with the Royal Bank of Canada and some of the IT companies said, we're going to create an organization like what they have in the U.S. and Canada. And that's how CAMPSI was started. So with this, a very, with the intentional reason of driving wealth in these underrepresented groups. So when they started, and my predecessor started, it was trying to educate the Canadian population on what that actually meant and how it was important to them. So when they talked about what are the benefits of supplier diversity, it really is, it's meant to support and promote those businesses who may face disadvantages at get, get, getting connected in the supply chain. It, it will help those who are new to Canada who don't have connections. And so when you try to sell things, you're looking for who do I know if I phone into a company or email into a company, who am I talking to? You don't know that with supplier diversity, we have designated individuals now who will take your calls, take the emails and say, okay, let me talk up to you about your business, how do we connect you in? And also we have governments now Federal government in particular has a social procurement policy, so they're looking to do work with diverse owned businesses. We have provinces now, I know Nova Scotia, the province of Nova Scotia is looking at it. There are other provinces across Canada. The city of Halifax has a social procurement policy that they're looking at. There's other cities across Canada. So the importance of that is now governments have mandates that they want to do work with diverse owned businesses. Corporate Canada wants to do work with diverse owned business and they need to know how to find them. And if you're new and if you don't have connections, this certainly opens the door for you to be able to do just that. Now, when we talk about every, every organization who wants to do business, they always talk about what's the return on investment for me? Why should I actually do this? Over the past number of years, with CAMPSI suppliers and doing business with corporate Canada and our government, there's more than a billion dollars to spend with diverse owned businesses. And let me say that again, a billion dollars in spend. 
That means we're not just talking the $10,000 contracts or the $25,000 contracts. We're talking large scale contracts that include diverse businesses at the table. Now, indeed, you might say, is this somewhat, you know, is this just altruistic? They're doing it just because? No, there's real money involved. And also what we have found when we talk to our corporate members is that these diverse suppliers exceed the buyer's expectations 76% of the time. So that's important. So they're not they're, they're not just finding they're great in the diverse category. They are great as suppliers and meeting exactly what their supplier contract says they're going to meet and over-delivering on that. We also know that 40, over 40% 40 of the global companies all have a supplier diversity program. So whether I'm talking the Accentures, whether I'm talking the Deloitte's, they have a supplier diversity program because it's important for them to have diverse suppliers so that they are representing their diversity across all aspects of their workplace. And when they actually look at the bottom line, they said for every $3.6 million on the bottom line, their diverse, their diverse programs add $3.6 million for every million dollars spent. So that is a good return when anybody talks about why should they be doing this? And, we've, and we have survey uh, information from the hacker group to say just that. Now, what I wanna make sure is that supplier diversity, when you hear this word, and as I said, you'll hear people use the term social procurement, they'll use the term economic inclusion, they'll use the term supplier diversity. There's all used sort of interchangeably. It is not a compromise on quality costs or any service requirements. When you, get, when you come into an organization under their program, you still have to deliver on everything you would deliver on any way, on any program that you sign into. It's not a social program. It's not a guarantee that they're actually going to give you a contract. What it simply is, it's a door that allows you to get to the table. It means if you're not represented in the supply chain to date that you're allowed to come to the table. It means that it's looking at minorities, indigenous, LGBT plus businesses, veteran owned businesses, persons with disability, women. You are being looked at differently to say, how do we include you? It's a proactive approach by corporations to identify, certify, and bring these diverse clients to the table. Your business must be 51% owned, managed, and controlled, either diverse and one of those diverse groups. And you can do business, if you can think of, with the main corporation, they're tier one, tier two. What we always talk about is where do you find your place in, in the supply chain? You might say, well, I'm a small owned business, and you're trying to do work with General Motors. Well, you might not do work with General Motors, but you might end up doing work with the person, the company who does work with General Motors. So you go General Motors, tier one, tier two, tier three. So find where you fit in the supply chain. And that's where you're able to actually start to build your capacity and move yourself up in the supply chain. That's what's important to think about. Now, um, the reason this has become important, when we think of the Canadian landscape, Canada loves to live on the word diversity. And you see any of the big cities in Canada talk about how diverse they are. And there's been studies that to say by 2036, one in three Canadians will be Indigenous or minority. So Canada is rolling into, there's a lot of diversity in there. And what we have found as well, with this growth in diversity, these diverse individuals are starting business at a faster rate than mainstream Canada. Indigenous were starting businesses nine times faster than mainstream. Women two times faster. Minorities one and a half times faster. So we have a lot more startups coming from this diverse group of people. And therefore with startups, they tend to be more innovative, more flexible. And if you're a large scale corporation and you're not taking advantage of what's new and what's innovative and what's flexible, you're missing out on growing your market share. You're missing out on innovative ideas that can help you get better at what you do. So that's truly a business transaction when they're looking for that. They're looking for what's the new, what's the best, what can I do with that? Also, this leads into, as I said, government mandates are now starting coming up uh, so that governments are now looking at most recently last year, government of Canada put a 5% um, mandate out there to do business with Indigenous businesses. So that's 5% of their spend with Indigenous businesses. That's a lot of potential opportunities that are out there on the table. We're looking to now with our social procurement policy, if, if we're going to roll that out to women and or minorities to be able to do business. And again, that opens a door up to you if you're a diverse business, what your opportunities look like. And so when you think about that, it becomes a business it becomes just an innate part of doing business, why corporations are now welcoming it to the table, why it's not just a nice thing to do, why it's helping to build their business. 
So I just leave you with that when you think about that. So when you think about why they're doing it, there's a really good business reason and a retention opportunity for you. Now, what we've seen, if you take a look at this, that the population, as I just said, we've seen the growth in the minority population over the years. We've seen the growth in the indigenous population over the years. These are fa the fastest growing populations in Canada when you think about that. So all in all, the governments and our corporations would be uh, remiss if they didn't consider why does this matter when I sell my products or services and when I buy products and services. This is very important to consider. The growth has been tremendous in the Canadian landscape. Having laid the foundation for you, why it's important, why governments, why corporates are thinking about it, let me talk a little bit about if you're considering becoming a member or thinking about actually using supplier diversity to help your business, why it's important to you. What are the key benefits that you get from that? So whether it be the certification, whether it be research, your ability to participate in different networks, your connection and the engagement that you can get out of that. So I wanted, I'm going to walk you through some of these and why this makes sense to you. Just a second. Okay, let me go back a little bit. Okay. One thing you'll hear the term certify across Canada, you'll hear a number of organizations talk about certification. When we're talking about certification, earlier you heard me say 51% own, managed, and controlled. Certifying means that the, organ, the certifying body will make sure your organization is owned, managed, controlled, minority, and or diverse group. And that's important because when you're owned, managed, and controlled, you get to make the decisions and you tend to hire people from your community or people who look like you. So what we're doing is we're building economic wealth in a larger community. We also, the benefits is when you join something like a CAMC, whether it be a CAMC, whether it be a CGLCC or WEBI, what this also means, you have opened up a whole new network that you might not have known of. So that be suppliers who might look like you, that might open up the door to different opportunities. The corporations who now are looking for diverse suppliers and come to councils like us to say, can you introduce me to diverse suppliers who can provide this, this, this. So you have the opportunity to have other areas on your map that you alone don't have to search and say, oh, who do I know at Bell or who do I know at Rogers? If you're part of CAMPSI, when you go into the database, it pops up who's in charge of supplier diversity at Bell. And when you call them or email them, they will connect you into their supply chain. So that opportunity to be able to get that instant connection, that opportunity to be invited to bid on RFPs. Because again, we'll get constantly lists from whether it be the J&Js, Johnson & Johnson of the world, whether it be the Toyotas of the world, whether it be the Rogers of the world, we're looking for suppliers who can provide translation services. We're looking for suppliers who can provide facilities management services. We're looking for suppliers who can provide printing services in this area. These are opportunities that in your small business, it's hard to find unless you do extensive search. But when you join larger networks, you're seeing them on a fairly regular basis and you're able to select or deselect yourself depending on your product or service. So your, operate to, your ability to connect, your ability to participate in webinars, in training organizations, in networking, much like the chamber has various networkings down there, you will get another uh, form of networking when you get enrolled in something like a camp C. So now you have business corporations coming to the table, whether they be in the US coming into Canada, whether they be in the Canadian landscape, and it broadens your scope of what you're able to pull from. There's also tools and resources that enable you to be able to pull from that to grow your business or help develop who you are. And so all these, when you think of as a small business owner, and I was a small business owner 20 years ago, and when I started off setting up my PC, starting to search, who am I going to do work with? What do I do? This becomes a fountain of a source of a lot of information to be able to pull from that simply is at your fingertips now and doesn't have you trying to sort of, let me scan here, let me scan here. It's now available to you at your fingertips. And that's important because as a small business owner, you want to have a, you want to be able to expedite getting the information and then reaching out to see if there's an opportunity or making that relationship. Now with CAMPC, and CAMPC, as I said, was one of many certifying bodies of six of us across Canada. We have almost 150 corporate members at the table who are looking for diverse suppliers. That's 150 corporations who are now have the ability to say, whether it's be your Scotia Bank, who's all across Canada, whether it's RBC, who's all across Canada, whether it's TELUS, whether it's the Rogers, whether it's uh, CBRE, just think about any corporation in the, in the Nova Scotia region, the Port of Halifax is one of the members. 
Sobeys is one of our members. So they indeed have identified their commitment to supplier diversity and how they do want to do business. So think about that. These are the opportunities now that you might not know anybody in those organizations, but your ability when you join CAMPSI allows you to get into these organizations and actually have that conversation. And depending on, and I'll just throw this out, if you are export ready, that means if you want to do business beyond your borders, you have organizations within this almost 150 who have operations in Canada, in the US, in Australia, in the UK, depending on where you want to do business and what if, whether it aligns to the opportunities available. So think about that when you're growing your business and you're thinking about what your next footprint will look like. Now, what I want to do with this is purely just give you an overview of where our corporate members come from. So we have we have, uh, as you can see, automotive industrial, we started with those guys. So we have 14% are sitting there. Financial and business services. I mean, that's all your banks that we have there. We're now seeing a lot of construction organizations. So corporations coming who are looking to build or people in facilities management, consumer and business products. So any, depending on what your product or service is or what sector you're in, you can find somebody in that sector who it makes sense that you might want to do business with. So just think about that. Because someone will say, well, are, are they concentrated in one sector? No, we have people coming from all over the all over the board who are quite interested and are looking for diverse suppliers. What I've just shown you here just gives you a range of who's out there. So whether it's be someone like the Citibank, the City of Brampton, the City of Toronto, it could be the CIBCs, it could be Fast Skins, a law firm, it could be the EYs, it could be food companies such, such as Barilla. Just think of Apple as one of our members as well. And so when you go down through, again, Jameson for the, when you think of the, um, the vitamins and everything else, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment, one of our customers, the Marriott, think of Merck's, the uh, drug, drug organization, McCain's Foods. These are all names that when you see the logo, you say, oh, I know who they are. These are all organizations who are committed to supplier diversity. These are all organizations. And when you think of them, they buy just a lot of these buy just about everything. So it's not just, uh, you know, if we're in Maple Leaf Sports, we're only buying this. Maple Leaf Sports, I mean, so their house, uh, the Raptors are under them, the the, um, the Maple Leafs are under them. We have the, the Blue Jays. So they have facilities that they're managing. They have marketing that they're managing. They have clothing for these teams that they're managing. Think of all the realm of what they're looking for. They have concession stands in these particular areas. And so then when you look at Merck's, Merck's sells drugs. So they have manufacturing facilities. They need to have paper that goes in their boxes. They need to have packaging that goes with that. There's a lot of things with Jameson. They're looking for products or services that help them when they build their vitamins. What does that look like? There's a whole lot of different things. Enterprise Holdings that's down there. Think of what Enterprise Holdings, they're their car rental company. What services do they need to be able to do that? So when you start to think about who's on the list, the possibilities are endless as to what product or service they're looking for. When you look at this, we have Rogers, we have Ryerson, we have Sobe sitting there. We have, uh, let's say, Nutrient, uh, the Potash Company out west is what they do. NSBI is one of our members down there. So just think of the range of things that they, that they can buy and what they're looking for when you consider what your potential opportunities look like. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about, I've talked to you about expert ready and what doors it opens up for you. So when you think about, when CAMPSI started, we were the first council in Canada. Uh, a few years later, we be Canada started and said they're focused on certifying women. And then we looked at uh, CGLCC, they're focused on certifying the LGBT owned community or business owned by the LGBT community. IWSCC, then they're focused on persons with disability and veteran owned businesses. So in the Canadian landscape, we've come together under an umbrella. So we're advocating to the federal government and that's how we got the policy on board that they, we, they need more representation from these underrepresented groups. We also go across Canada as a group. We were in Nova Scotia, I think in July last year between uh, the Valley and Halifax. And this year we'll be back again, probably in Halifax as well as potentially PEI in New Brunswick to try to get more diverse suppliers on board with us. And so as a team, we uh, we tell our suppliers that they can do work with other suppliers in these networks. But as I said, if you're export ready and you go to the uh, right-hand side of that screen, you'll see GSDA, Global Supplier Diversity Alliance. We also partner and we have uh, sister organizations in China. 
We have in the supply nation in South Africa, in Australia, in the UK. We also work with We Connect International, has women all across the, the globe. We do work with NGLCC, which is the American version of the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce. We do work with veterans down there as well as the disability group. So depending on what your connection is, we can probably get you connected to another organization if you're expert ready and you want to take your product and services someplace. Seldom do you have all that under one umbrella that enables you to do just that. But what we have found is we're trying to meet our suppliers where they are. So depending on what you bring to the table, depending on where you want to grow your business, you might say, I'm perfectly comfortable in the Atlantic region. That's where I do my best business. I'm geographically based and this works well. Or in times of COVID, what we found is we can cross borders without leaving our home office. So you might say, I've got a product or service that works well nationally. Can you connect me into someone in BC or company in BC? Or, you know, I think this will work well in the European market. So then we connect into the UK and the UK has offices in other parts of Europe as well. So it just depends on what you want to do, but we have built alliances and we've built partnerships with all these organizations because we realize we want to have the paths or opportunities for our suppliers to be able to grow, whether it be from Nova Scotia to across Canada, whether it be from Nova Scotia into the U.S., or whether it be from Nova Scotia into other parts of the globe. What does, what does, that, what does that look like for you? And that's what's important for us when we do this. Now. As I've said to you, the benefits of certification, should you think, should you consider CAMPSI as an option, it provides you the network and opportunities. Each year we'll have a big procurement fair, we'll have a big two-day conference in downtown Toronto where we bring corporations in, we set up various education sessions, we also set up mini matchmaking, so you have some one-on-one -on -one time with these corporations to talk about what your capability statement is, what your idea, what you're, what you're trying to provide. And so therefore, as well, have done some homework on them to be able to say, I see you're looking at electrification. We have done some work in electrification. We think we're prime for that. You'll also, as I said, have contact details for all these corporate members as well as suppliers. So depending on if your best work is, I, I want to work with other suppliers because what I can help them do is this, 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 then that might be prime. And you just use that side of the database and reach out to those. You also have the opportunity to capacity fill. Much as the chamber has a variety of webinars and sessions that you can go to, CAMPSI opens you up to a variety of sessions as well that enable you to help grow your business and build your capacity. As I said, the international opportunities are prime because whether it be someone, I remember when I started this work very early on, it was somebody like a, a Cisco at that time, they had identified a supplier that they were working with, and they took them with them across the globe. They introduced them in each geographic region they went through, went with. So Mike went from a $10 million company to a $100 million company because as they, they took them across, he got new customers and new clients each way he did. So he built independent offices that had allowed him to have this global presence. So it really depends on how you align to your particular client. We also partner with, I know in the Nova Scotia region, you'll have people such as uh, Futurepreneur, we also partner with Access Employment here in Toronto, and we also partner with CANDU, which is the Economic Development Officers for the Indigenous Communities across Canada. And so we partner with all these guys to make sure, is there a connection that they have businesses who make sense, that you want to do business with them? What does that look like? What we're focusing on this year will be trade missions. Last year, we took a trade mission into um, New Orleans. This year, we're going to be taking a trade mission into at least one or two into the US, at least another one into Amsterdam and or London. And I believe we're also doing an Australian trade mission. So depending on what you wanna do, what your product or service is, think about how that potentially might fit in with what your opportunities are. Now, what I have here now, I will apologize. There's a lot of words on the page, but let me tell you what exactly you're looking at. Our corporations have come to us and they said, we're looking for people or businesses who can do this. So on a regular basis, we get asked for, can you search the database or do you have anybody? If, so if you go down that list, we're going everywhere from Alberici, who's looking to invite people to bid as they're building the battery plant in Windsor. They're looking for people of every aspect as they build that battery plant to apply for that. If we're looking at Barilla, Barilla is looking for a stretch film, fiber corner posts, palette tear sheets, layers, 
thermal uh, thermal ink tape. You're looking for a BDC. BDC is looking for consultants who can help them with the career development uh, strategy. They're looking for furniture. They're looking for people who do web design. Drop down to um, EDC. Again, they're looking for people in the marketing realm. They're looking for a media strategy planning and buying. They're looking for translation services. Take a look at Ford. Ford's looking for a design and manufacturer four foot and eight foot posts for commercial outdoor use. Cable management system. Material being aluminum extrusion and galvanized steel. Again, HSBC, digital business cards. Who does that? Nike, they're looking for people in the creative strategy agency and they're looking for people who do benefits administration. If you're looking at RBC, they're looking at founders, uh, foundations in agricultural management. TD, printing, document management. You can see they're all over the board and what they're looking for. And this is just a range of what we pulled out because on a regular basis, we get corporations sending out and they, one, they might go in the database and search themselves to say, ah, I wonder who's out there. Two, they might come to us and say, do you have anybody who does this? And so the team, the supplier engagement team will put on a notice across the network and say, potential opportunity, are you interested in this potential opportunity? And so therefore, when they gather the interest and then they do the shortlisting, they might send that off to whether it be the RBCs, the Mondelez, the HSBC say, this is a range of the suppliers who are interested with your contact details, and then they'll come back to you. So this is what, as I said, as a small business owner, when I ran my business, this is what I was looking for on a daily basis. So I'd be out searching, whether it be on Merck's bids and tenders, I'd be able, whether I want to uh, register with a province of Nova Scotia, be sort of a supplier record. You spend your time doing this. In this network, these opportunities come to you. You can actually filter through what do they look like and how do they fit what you're trying to do. Now, when you consider, say, do I want to be a supplier? And am I, you know, am I big enough, small enough, or how do I fit in that supplier range? Well, as you can tell, we started out, when we started, we started out with some small-scale suppliers, and they've grown over the years. So 22 of our supply base has a top-line revenue of 500000 and under. 33% of our database has a top-line revenue from $500,000 to $5 million. And then the other 45 is top line for 5 million and above. So we have ranged from very small to we have like companies who are $50 million, $100 million top line revenue. And they are still diverse owned and they're still sort of making their way through the network. And some of them are reaching out and including others in that realm as they grow. But when you look at what industries or what do they supply, and I'm not going to say what industry, but what do they supply? 17% are in the consulting area. We've got 9% in construction another 14% and somewhere in the IT computer world, 12% in business and industrial. So just think where your product or service fits and how you fit into that. And if you don't see yourself in there, what well, we have seen as new organizations come to us, suppliers come out. Suppliers say, oh, I just see Nike joined up. And all of a sudden, those who are in that particular realm, they start to show up and say, I want to register now. And so again, it's a matter of who do we have on board and does that interest you and does that align to your product or service? So I'd say, depending on where you are or whatever you're doing right now, one of the things that we're trying to get more of, we're trying to get more in the food and beverage business because with the Sobeys and with, we're talking to Whole Foods and a few others, we want to make sure we are able to deliver on that. Starbucks has clearly said to us a couple of years ago, we need more food, food and beverage people. Because when you think of you go into a Starbucks, that little line just before you get to the cash, they'd like to get local products inside there, right? So they're looking for, do you have local sub vendors who can provide something that we can actually fill that? And so those are the types of things to think about when you're thinking about where does my product fit? Where does my service fit? What do I do? Over COVID, think of all the wellness companies that came to wellness, uh, mental health work, all the online business, all the cybersecurity. Corporations are looking for a lot of that, all the things that help go into my employee's home and help them set up ergonomics, things along those lines. They became very viable at that particular point in time. Always assess where the market's going and how you fit with where the market's going. That's what's important for you to do as a business owner. Now, what I'm just showing you now, and um, we're just in the throes of changing over from our bid and go system into our Salesforce system. But what you're still going to be able to do when you're in the system, on the right-hand side, we will still have a listing of all the companies, all the corporations that we have over there. So you'll still be able to go on, tick on if I um, want to do work with Accenture, 
And you, when you click on that, it will tell you who's in Accenture, that, what the contact details are in Accenture, who you're dealing with, and how do you access them. And so any of our corporations, you can go through, find out who do I want to meet and how do I get in touch with them. And on the left-hand side, this will go through. We have a whole listing of everybody in the database. So if you want to search by keyword, you're going to find out, I want to find other companies like me who do 3D printing. Let me put 3D printing. It will drop down everybody who's in that realm. And maybe that's somebody you want to partner with or say, I want to work with you. So when there's a big bid coming out, I want us to bid together. Or if you're looking for someone who does um, automotive seats, seats for uh, automotives, you might put that in there. If you're looking for prom promotional, so it could be keyword, it could be company, it could be next codes. It could be by geography that you're looking for people. Who are the other companies in Nova Scotia who are doing business? That might be there, or you might be searching by commodity. But our new database will allow the same flexibility that you can find who you're looking for inside the database early and easy enough to be able to either do work with them or look and uh, connect with them to build relationships or you're bidding on opportunities. It just depends on what you're looking for. Um, now on our website, if you have an opportunity to look on the website, uh, what we'll do is we'll host our events on the website. You'll have an opportunity out there to click into what the events are. That will be setting out there. We'll click into any resources we have available out there. And sort of what the latest news, we always get news from our partners on what's going on in their areas and their events. And we'll also share that with you as well. So as I said, if you have the opportunity to go in and take a search, that's always available to you. And keep up to date on that because a lot of... Um, while we spend a considerable time on the website, we also do mailing that goes out to you. So you will receive from us on an ongoing basis, whatever the latest that's coming and going from a mail out. So therefore you then, um, you then can actually access whatever the latest that's come out. So whether the federal government's doing something, whether the city of Toronto is looking for someone to do that, you'll get updates on that on a regular basis. <laughs> Again, this would be a particular of our, of our website, our networking. What I want to key you in on, April 18th and 19th, we will have an in-person procurement fair in downtown Toronto, where, as I said, education and matchmaking goes on. Great opportunity, if you're already in the database, to start to, start to continue to build on those relationships face-to-face. There's nothing better than being in front of your client and talking about what your potential, what you see as a nice alignment between what you what your product or services are and where the future of their organization's at. Our, uh, we have a, an Achievement Gala Award in September in the fall of the year when we celebrate the successes of what's gone by in the year. We also try to put some workshops around there. So therefore, if you're in the city, you're in the city to do workshops and while well, you end with a gala dinner that evening. We have supplier forum sessions. So year round, we probably have about four or five supplier forum sessions where we bring the suppliers together and they get to share what's going on, whether we have some training as part of that, whether we just have some conversation, hot topics, we'll use that period of time. And we also have some knowledge exchange where we have some two hour workshops that have some hands on roll up your sleeves. This is what you can do with what's there. Um, and last but not least, the... If all that is of interest to you, then by all means, reach out to the supplier support at Campsy, reach out to myself. And because what I was trying to do today was give you a broad overview of who we are and what we do. But again, this just uh, just broad strokes and there's so much more when you think about what's out there. And there might be particular questions that says, oh, in my business in particular, how does this align? Or is this the right time? time for me to be part of that network. Those are the types of things we'd love to have that discussion to see how that fits. So with this, uh, what I'm gonna do, Josh, just stop sharing so we can come back to camera. Does that work? Perfect. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Okay, perfect. What an informative presentation. Um, I'll, I'll let a few, I see uh, questions are starting to trickle in now. So. Okay. As we let them uh, flow through, I'm going to steal an opportunity to ask a, a question of my own. Uh, what does the supplier onboarding process look like? Okay, what we actually do is the team will take you through it. So there's be an orientation process to make sure that one, let me walk you through what's all available 
inside Camp C because too often you join an organization and you have no idea what you join and what you can do. So what the team does is one, make sure all your information is filled out, make sure keywords, make sure your market profile, make sure you're clear on what you have there and how you represent it. And then talk to you about what's available, what's upcoming for us, what does it make sense for you to be part of? Because what's important is everybody has a different journey. So it could be, tell me what, tell me your objectives in joining. Let me see how we can align what's going on over the next couple of months or over the year to your object objectives to ensure you align with that. So the team will take you through that. So you have a better idea when you come out of that. Okay, what I really want to do is this and this. And, you know, I've seen all these things, but I'm going to focus on this and this. And it allows you to focus and better utilize the network. Very, very cool. Makes sense. Um, what sort of infrastructure and or readiness is needed for my business to be ready to work with larger corporations? Okay. Um, I think it's a matter of who you want to work with and sort of what, for me, the biggest thing is let's identify the, the industries or the corporates you want to do. Cause you might know this, but if you talk to the supplier engagement person, they might say, have you thought about this and this and this? So one, getting the handle who else is there. What other, what might be tier ones into that organization? Because tier ones could mean that I don't have to be huge, actually start my build and actually start building the capacity and doing work there. The other thing is, do you have your capability statement ready? You know, what have you put in place, your one pager, so the corporate or the tier one know exactly who you are, what you're capable of, who you might have done business with in the past. So that's almost your calling card. So there's some things as your calling card that you want to have ready. So when they ask you, they said, or they might, or it could be something as simple as said, have you already registered on our portal? So they might've seen your market profile, but then they want you to go in because we've, we've asked you for certain items, but they might say, we want this and this and this for us to be able to vet you. So that's a type of thing when we talk about, so are you ready? It really depends on where you want to be and who you're trying to do business with. Makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Um, now, as a corporate entity, what are some, uh, um, ongoing practices aside from the the uh, you know social procurement um, uh, operation that I can do to make my uh, corporate entity more welcoming and attractive to suppliers that may want to um, present themselves to me. Okay, I think the biggest things is one: if you have your supplier diversity or your policy statement on your on your website, make mm -hmm. sure it identifies who you are and what you want to do and how welcoming you are. And then if you have a contact person or a portal that they can come into, because as a diverse supplier, I want to make sure I land someplace that they know who I am. Because in the early days when they would, let's say before City of Toronto came on board or when they're, they're first come on board, someone phoned up City of Toronto and said, well, I see you're, you have a policy statement and whoever they talked to, they said, I don't know what that looks like. I, I, I'm not sure what you're talking to. So that communication as an organization, I identify your policy statement who's actually responding to emails or the phone calls, who's coming in the door? Are they well-versed in what you're doing? And what are the steps you want to lay in place? Because what you want to do is manage expectations. At no time do you want the supplier to think that they're coming, they get a contract that's gone. If you have a process, how do you, how do you communicate that process so people understand that we have a window before we vet you that, you know, our, all our contracts or, you know, the majority of our contracts happen, you know, in the fall of the year. But what we try to do is we try to sort of walk through to sort of we know sort of where, what avenue you fit in. And then as we get on board with that, then there's a whole register in our portal. And then you get called into the shortlist and then you call. All that is something that if you can communicate and distill it down to some information that the supplier understands, they don't get lost along the way or they don't get frustrated along the way. And you're allowing them to come with you. Of course, makes sense. Okay, I got another one here in the chat. What, mm, can you speak to the credibility that uh, being a part of an organization like CAMC is, gives to my business as a supplier? Okay, um, there's no question. What, okay, the credibility it gives you. So as a supplier, one tick that means that uh, you're not, there's a lot of, organ when corporations come to us and they're looking for diverse suppliers, they're looking to say, are they truly a business or are they a fly-by-night? The fact that you've actually got your paperwork together back, if, whether you're auditor or you have your management bar review statements, you've actually gone through that process. You have a capability statement. That actually lifts you above a number of requests. Our corporates will say, we get, we get requests, but when we go, we check that there's no website, there's no this, we don't have any of the information. At least if they've come through you, we know that we have those foundational elements in place. And then what you will 
find is as you reach and talk to corporate members, they all talk to each other. So whether you might not be a valid or might not be aligned to this opportunity, they might be talking to each other and said, have you think, thought about Susan Ford? We were talking to the other week. We don't have room with our right now. We're not in that line, but it might be a perfect fit for you. So the credibility comes from your building relationship and they become your marketing advocates as well. It makes perfect sense. Thank you for that, Cassandra. And one last question. How can suppliers reframe their value proposition to be more attractive to corporate entities? I know you mentioned about the, the capability statement. Are things like that, some are, 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 should folks consider like putting things like that in their value proposition? Um, I think their value propositions, why do they exist? What are they doing? What are they bringing to the table? I think they, I always tell suppliers, be very crisp and clear. No one wants a generalist who does, I can do anything. They're looking for what exactly do you do? So be very clear on what you do. So make sure your keywords, all those are clear. And what, when you create your market pro profile, it's very distinct. And so when people are looking for that, they're, they're looking to say, have they actually used that terminology? Do they do that? A capability statement should always follow you. Because if someone's going to reach out, the next thing they're going to want to be, they're going to want to see is, oh, what do they actually do? Who they've done business with? They're going to want to see that capability statement. When you think about what's going on, what's prevalent, this day and age in the news and in business, cybersecurity is huge. So your ability to manage the risk will be a big thing. So if you're in that world of IT, there should be something that you're doing as it relates to cybersecurity. Sustainability is big. What are you doing in your own practices as it relates to, 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 sustain, to sustainability? Over COVID, we found the whole focus on local markets became huge. That allowed corporations to manage risk. How does that... All these should be things that in your value proposition, in your write-up, indicates that you've taken into consideration and you're addressing what their needs are. Because when you read any corporations, whether it be their annual report, whether it be their statements of where they're going, well, what you want to make sure you're aligned to where are they going? Are you interested in the same things? Are you doing the same things? Are you managing the risk? Because when we went through that world of blockchain, it was all about you know the weakest link. That's all about, are you managing my risk? If I let you into my database, are you, is your database wide open? Is your back door wide open? What have you done to manage that? When we look at sustainability now, who's not looking at, what? Well, how do I reduce my carbon footprint? What is that, What have I done to my sustainability practice? Make sure you mention that because corporations are not just looking for that product. So if they're looking at, you're helping them align to their sustainability goals as well. So those are things when you try to reframe. Those are things to think about that are very serious and taken into consideration when they're assessing who they're bringing on board. Makes perfect sense. Thank you, Cassandra. And one last one, what kind of mentor, I know you, you touched on this briefly, but can you speak about the, uh, the mentorship opportunities that are available through uh, CMASC? Well, right now we're working with getting some executives and residents who will, we want to align them up to businesses. So we want to see where the alignment point is that they can help to mentor them in where, as they grow. Because too often we sit here and we do, we can do that straight line business we've done yesterday. But what, we're, what we should be focused on is how do we build our capacity? How do we build so we can move to the next level? What does that look like? And you should be able to talk to someone in the corporate environment or someone as a senior executive to be able to help you address that and get over that hurdle into the next level playing field. So right now, I think we have... Uh, we have some executives from the banks, from the autos, and from, I forget where else, there's a couple that have lined up. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to align them to, um, sorry about that. We're trying to align those two suppliers to make sure it helps you to build and develop capacity. Very, very cool. What a what an informative uh, webinar. What a, a very eye-opening and, and quite honestly, um, just motivating um presentation it's 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 so encouraging to see especially given like like you said how uh you know these conversations to diversify uh corporate supply chains that started so long ago over a decade ago um just to see where it is is, is super super encouraging um and we have uh so many members who uh who i know can take full advantage of this um so with that i'll leave a few more seconds if there's any other questions that anyone wants to pop into the chat and if not, then I'll say some housekeeping and, and closing words and, and wrap us up. Cassandra, is there any, any last thing you want to leave us with? Well, what I'd like to say is that when I, when I talk about supplier diversity, it's building a relationship. 
and what it does because business is to business with people they know, respect, trust. So what supplier diversity does is help you to create that relationship. And we always try to manage expectations because you might not get a contract your first six months, your first year, but it could be that relationship about that by the time they're into 18 months to a year, they said, you've been doing work in our region for a while, haven't you? We have an opportunity I think might be prime for you. And all of a sudden, once that door opens up, it's amazing what grows from there. Because I can think of one of my staffing firms who started by, you know, you know, very early in the game, you know, I can do a little bit of work, a little bit of work. They got hauled in to do a small piece. The next year, a little bit bigger. Before you know it, they became their supplier of choice in both the Canada and the U.S. landscape. And it starts mm -hmm. one relationship at a time. And then what one core organization does, if I believe in you, I'm going to suggest you to my tier ones. That's what our automotives do. Our automotives say they take camps and they camps to suppliers and say, our tier ones, if you're not able to meet your supplier diversity needs, let me introduce you to some diverse suppliers that will certainly help you to do that. So I encourage people to think about this as a marathon. Think about this as you build and not just for the Nova Scotia region, but as you grow your footprint across Canada and beyond. Think about what that looks like. What I'd love to be able to do with the Halifax Chamber is I've given you some foundational elements of who camps is and what we do. But at another time, bring in one of our corporate member, bring in one of our local suppliers who can talk to real life experience about what it has done for their business and why they think it's important. Because I think when you hear about others who are doing it, you're saying, I never quite thought about that. That makes perfect sense. So whether it's like my port of Halifax, whether it's the NSBI, whether it's Sobeys, why are you actually doing it? You've got a million things you'd be using your time and energy. Why is this important? And if so, what have you done with this? How has it helped you either grow your social license, your business, your connection to diversity? Talk to us about that. And then to have a supplier to say, how difficult it is, is it to get in the supply chain? And what has this opened the door for you? And so therefore, and you know, and we're given sort of, given where I am in your art, does it make sense for me at this point in time? Because I say it a lot, if you've just, you know, I left Deloitte and started my business when I was in Deloitte Consulting, I was instantly ready to do consulting when I started my business. Other people start their business and they just have an idea, they're doing the prototype, they're not this year. Think of where you are in the stages of your business. Where does it make sense for you to start? Always consider, is this the right time for me? You know, is my geographic footprint, am I, am I just building my base here? Do I have enough? Think about where you are in your journey and what resources you need to help you do that. Sometimes you might be the right spot to be able to say, well, you have the right development tools that I need. You have the right contacts that I need. You have given, can provide me access to, you know, people who know how to do financing. That could be the right time for you to build that, that aspect. But it's always consider, because I always love organizations, whether it be chamber, whether it be camps, organizations come with resources. And as a small business, you need access to those resources. And that's why organizations like that are primed to help you grow. So I'll leave you with that. Amazing. And there you go, folks. Stay resilient and stay re resourceful. Um, yeah, amazing advice. So sadly, we're, we're out of time. So I'm going to wrap it up here, everyone. Thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. We have a few more webinars going on next month, including one focused on DEA and I intersectionality. So that one will be happening on February 7th um, from 11 or sorry, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So I hope to see you there. We're also hosting a luncheon next month um, about the Port of Halifax's 50 year plan. So uh, that should be very interesting and it should uh, pertain to many of our members. Um, so that'll be on February 9th at the Marriott Hotel. So we still have some tickets available. Be sure to go check out our website and we'd love to have you there with us. Um, head to halifaxchamber.com slash events to register. Um, and again, Pat mentioned this uh, as he was, uh, uh, opening up, opening us up, but the webinar, this webinar is recorded and uh, there was so much value in it. So please, please share it with a friend, uh, share it with a colleague, someone who you think could benefit from it. Um, and it'll be up on our website by the end of the week. So um, with that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I look forward to connecting again and hosting another webinar to get the message out to our members um, and enjoy the rest of your week. Okay. Take care all. Bye-bye. Bye, Cassandra. Thanks again.